Okay, so for Fed number 78, uh, <clears throat> this one's all about the judiciary branch, written by Alexander Hamilton. This one I did not ask you guys to uh, read because I forgot to. Uh, so I'm going to need you to definitely watch this one, go over this one, quickly go through the document, things of that sort. But this is all an argument of the judiciary branch. I'm just going to keep moving my hat and uh, apparently touch my face for the billionth time. So three things on this one. They'll be inoculated from politics, inoculated. God, I'm intelligent. Uh, it won't be that powerful, I promise. And then we see the introduction of judicial review. So point one, uh, they'll be inoculated from politics. So uh, as you can see on the right here, when Alexander Hamilton was writing this, he was thinking all about like, good behavior in school. But that might be a way to think about this idea here, um, because originally in England uh, at this time or before this time, um, <clears throat> like judges served at the behest of the king. Whereas that's not something we want here. We want judges serving uh, to fulfill the Constitution, really. And we're going to do things a little bit different in terms of how they end up, which will ensure that they are inoculated from politics. So I'll go over the supporting details here. It says the manner of constituting, it seems to embrace these several objects. Like one, look at how we're going to appoint the judges. So this gets into that idea of checks and balances, separation of powers. The president gets to nominate judges and then, excuse me, the Senate is the upper house, uh, has the ability to advise and consent the president on those judges. So that's something that's key right on the uh, forefront there, because if the Senate fulfills its responsibility of being, uh, you know, the better type of man who's going to be able to think about the here and the long term. Uh, we're going to get good judges in that sense. And if the president puts up bad judges that, that aren't going to fulfill their jobs effectively, the Senate can say they're not going to be the right ones uh, to be in these positions. So that's one layer there. And two, he talks about the tenure. Uh, and this gets into that idea on the good behavior. That's why I put that there. So uh, there are certain ground rules. There's a certain set. Like, look, you'll get a nice salary. Uh, you'll be able to serve for life but you can't abuse the office. Uh, you can't abuse, you can't take advantage of the position that you have there. You are accountable to what is termed as this good behavior, which is gonna help to uh, further ensure that, you know, like the sanctity or the independence of uh, this branch will remain. And then you can see in 3D, the partition of the judiciary authority between different courts and their relations to each other. And you can see that with the district level, the appellate level, and then the Supreme Court level that we have, uh, and the fact that, you know, something moves through multiple levels, you have different people looking at it, all who are expected to be on good behavior, who have been appointed in the same manner, uh, more or less. So really just getting into the fact that we'll be inoculated from politics. So unfortunately, he was, or fortunately, depending on what you look at it, uh, they say it won't be that powerful, I promise. We know that's not the case, but this was his argument for it. Uh, so supporting details, he says the judiciary from the nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous. So if you look in the Constitution, you know, you got explicit stuff for the legislative branch in Article 1. Article 2, not a lot on the president, but we know how much power is in those words that are said, just thinking like commander in chief, for instance, there's not that much on the courts. Um, and to kind of further make this point, like when the Supreme Court first came about, like they were in the basement of the Capitol. Uh, you know, they, they, they were considered so unimportant. Um, so like they, they never thought they were going to have this much power. And when you're reading those, you'll see this whole like part on this, where he says the executive not only disperses the honors, but holds the sword of the community. The legislature not only commands the purse, but prescribes the rule, so on and so forth. So basically he's like, look, the executive has all that. The legislative has all that. Then the judiciary on the contrary has no influence over either the sword or the purse. Like if the president wants to take us to war, he's got to get that from Congress, not the judicial branch sort of idea there. Uh, if Congress is looking to set rules out and they put out legislation, the president's the one who's going to sign that. 
But it's not like the judicial branch is going to run in in the midst of a piece of legislation being created and say that is unconstitutional and then somehow like throw off the process. Right. Like and if you look at the system of sec, uh, checks and balances and separation of powers, like when the judicial branch comes about, it's at the end. You know, like you could create a law that the president signs in uh, or the Congress can create a law that a bill that the president signs into law that uh, unless challenged never gets to the Supreme Court. Like they're just saying, look, like we're giving them so much stuff. But these guys, they only really have one really, really big job when it comes to what those other branches are doing. And that gets to the third point. And this is where we see the introduction of judicial review. So uh, when Chief Justice uh, John Marshall and Marbury v. Madison says, look, like I'm going to give myself this power, right? The greatest power grab in the history of American, uh, excuse me, the history of the world or the history of the country. He's able to point back to um, Fed 78. So I'll read this detail to you. The complete independence of the courts of justice is peculiar. I cannot say that word out loud. Peculiar, right? Like it's impossible. I just kind of stop right there. Is essential in a limited constitution. By a limited constitution, I understand which uh, one which contains certain specified exceptions to the legislative authority, such, for instance, as it shall pass no bills of attainder, no ex post facto laws and the like, Limitations of this kind can be preserved in practice no other way, uh, no other way than through, I can barely see straight, through the medium of courts of justice, whose duty it must be to declare all acts contrary to the manifest tenor of the Constitution void. So this, he goes on a whole bunch of stuff about judicial review, and it's like, look, this is what their job is. They're going to have the power to basically declare laws unconstitutional if they're conflicting with the Constitution. And eventually we know with the Bill of Rights uh, and things of that sort. But that's their job. That's what they're going to do. Uh, they're going to hold the legislative and executive branches accountable through that ability of judicial review. But again, back to what I was saying in that previous slide, like that's not like that's their main power. That's their main thing that they're doing here in regards to this whole system of separation of powers and checks and balances. They're not going to they're not given the sword. They're not given, you know, all those powers to write bills and laws like uh, and rules like Congress. And they can't impede them there. They can't cut them off. But what they can do is ensure that those branches are upholding uh, the expectations, the values, the principles, the ideas of what's in the Constitution. And that's where they can play that role. So it's limited. Um, it's reactionary. It's not like they're the ones who are taking a country into war and really break, making that movement occur. They're not the ones who are writing the laws. They're reactionary to the actions of the other two branches. And with that being the case, uh, what that really ultimately does is it limits them. It limits their ability to truly impact, uh, you could say, the day-to-day -day aspects of our country and our society. So that is that on Fed 78.